Alive Again Ministries traditional worship service that we do every Sunday afternoon between 4.30 and 5.30 Eastern Standard Time. And we want to welcome those who are here in person. And we want to also welcome those that have joined us on live stream. And also those that might be joining us uh, through Zoom. And uh, I'm going to ask Jim if he would come up here and do our uh, call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jim. And I'm going to ask Mike if he would lead us in a prayer of invocation. Father, we come to you this afternoon thanking you for who you are and what you've done in our lives, through our lives. Lord, how you have allowed us to be your hands and feet and mouthpieces and hearts to love and to cherish and to reach out and to tell people the good news. Father, I think of the, the scripture today and, and I always get hung up on uh, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. And what it shows me is that, Lord, you, you understand my sorrows and my iniquities and my sadness and my frailness that you can relate to me in a way that no human being can relate to me and that you forgive me in spite of myself lord thank you for today i ask that you be with woody as he brings the message lord let your spirit be just all over him this this afternoon that he would preach your word and nothing else. And Father, I thank you for those that are here and those that are watching on the uh, YouTube and on the screen. Lord Jesus, we ask that you bathe this place. Holy Spirit, that you bathe this place in your power and your love and your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. All right, we, uh, we're missing our song leader. He uh, is in Boston, and we hope and pray that he gets back safe and sound later tonight. Uh, Russell did a uh, seminar up in Boston, in the Boston area, and uh, he was in the airport for what, 12 hours, something like that, the other day, because his flight was delayed and delayed and delayed. But anyway, so we're going to try to bumble through without Russell. It will be hard, but we'll do our best, right? Uh, I think Don and Michael and I can handle this. Okay. Well, Pauline King. And Pauline's here. here. Oh, thank you. Praise oh, Lord. that's right. Yeah. And Kaden. Yeah. Kaden can uh, help us out a lot there. There you go. All right. Our theme, our theme hymn uh, that we sing every week is And Can It Be? And the uh, scripture verse is taken from Romans chapter 5, verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All right, and can it be? Oh, oh, oh. 
4,000 tons to sing, which is uh, located in the hymnal that we use on 21, page 21. And uh, the scripture verse of this is taken from Psalm 35, verse 28. Uh, my tongue will speak of your praise all day long. What key?
thank you for everybody uh, being with us. I'm going to ask Paul again to come up here, and he's going to read a long passage, but uh, it's a passage that uh, that is just so incredibly, incredibly blessing, uh, incredible blessing to us when we hear the the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. We're actually in a uh, series right now, getting ready for Easter. Easter's coming up, uh, I think, two weeks from today. And uh, we started this series last week. Uh, I've called this series Preview to the Resurrection. Uh, actually, yesterday, uh, I went to a funeral and I saw the senior pastor here at Old Color. And I told him, I said, oh, I'm doing a series uh, getting ready for Easter. Uh, and I'm entitled it Preview to the Resurrection. And he said, oh, it gets all the time. He says, can I use that next year? I said, absolutely. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, when I was growing up, uh, when I was growing up, I got so excited when I got to go to the movies. I really enjoyed going to the movies. And I always wanted to be sure that be there for the previews, because the previews were almost more exciting than the actual movie that you were going to see, because you had the anticipation, oh, that movie's coming. And so uh, what we looked at last week was the Transfiguration, which is the first trailer that we uh, looked at, getting ready for the resurrection, the real thing, the real resurrection of Jesus. And today we're looking at the uh, resurrection, the first resurrection that takes place in the life of Lazarus. And then next week, we're going to look at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday. So, all right, so, all. so this is the second trailer. Yeah. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. It can be found in your bulletin, or if you've got a Bible, John 11, or you can find it on your phone. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whom Jesus, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the the word, this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But, uh, but let us go see him. Then Thomas, also known as Dimas, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. 
After she said this, she went back and called her sis to her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and, said to, and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He said, Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. The Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by, the time there is a, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. And I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and cloth around his face. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. God bless our hearing and understanding of his holy word. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. O oh Lord, our, our Father, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, our Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, one God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this incredible uh, historical account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. We thank you this this is but a preview of the greater resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ after he'd been crucified, dead, and buried. And we thank you even more that we have the hope of the eternal resurrection because of Jesus Christ and his resurrection after the cross, uh, after dying on the cross. We ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Okay, uh, long passage here, long passage. Yeah, it's very interesting. You would think that this uh, this account, this historical account, would would have uh, been in all all four of the Gospels, but it's not. It's only in John. Now in Luke, uh, some of you might remember that in Luke, it uh, right after right after Jesus right after Jesus does the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, he goes to the home of. Mary and Martha, and he has a little seminar with his uh, disciples, and some of you might remember that uh, those of you know anything about codependency, uh, and even if you don't know something about codependency, it is a clear biblical uh, historical account of somebody being totally codependent. Uh, in that seminar, Jesus is, uh, you know, in the home of Mary and Martha, and, and uh, he's got, you know, the 12 disciples, and, you know, some of those guys are big old fishermen, you know, and uh, he's got, uh, probably Lazarus is there because he also is the brother of Mary and, and Martha, and, uh, and Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and thrall with every single syllable that comes out of Jesus' mouth. But Martha, it says in that account, this is in Luke chapter uh, 10, Martha in that account is busy. And she is really busy doing all the kind of things that a hostess needs to do. Uh, she was basically making the tuna fish sandwiches and making lemonade for 
know, or sweet tea or whatever it was they're going to drink. And uh, she was very busy, busy, busy. And so there's a little break there in the seminary, in the seminar, and Martha comes to Jesus, and she says, in a very co because codependents want to live their lives through somebody else, uh, she says to Jesus, tell Mary to get off of her rear end and get in here and help me make the tuna fish sandwiches. And Jesus looks at Martha and he says, Martha, 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 you're preoccupied with a lot of things. Mary has chosen the best thing. He rebukes, basically he rebukes his codependency kind of thing. Now, I don't know this, it doesn't say this in scripture, so this is conjecture on my part, but, you know, knowing what I know about Jesus and other uh, passages, uh, Jesus was, he was, uh, he was not hesitant to rebuke. I have a sneaking fe feeling, I really think that this is probably true, that if Mary had said to Jesus, Mary, or uh, whispered in Jesus, tell Martha to come sit down here and listen to everything you're having to say, I have a feeling that Jesus would have said, you know, there are only two kinds of business, my business and none of my business. And it's none of your business what Martha's doing. Somebody's got to make the tuna fish sandwiches for these big strapping disciples that I have with me. Somebody's got to do that. Now, I'm just, that's the judge on my part. Now, that takes place. And then later, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. The setting for, for what happens here in John chapter 11, the setting is this. Jesus had gone up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. This was the very last year of his life. This is the uh, third year of the life of Jesus. Jesus, you know, the third year of his uh, earthly ministry. And he had gone up for the winter festival known as the Dedication uh, Festival. And while he was there, the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and the folks at the you know, top of the food chain uh, politically and socially and uh, theologically, you know, the religious leaders uh, who pretty much ran things uh, in the Jewish community in Jerusalem, they had finally had enough of Jesus. And Jesus said some things and upset them even more and they actually picked up stones and they were threatening to stone Jesus. And of course, it wasn't time for Jesus to die, and not the way God intended for him to die, God the Father intended for him to die. And so they were prevented from stoning him. And then it says that right after that, he and the disciples left, and they went across the Jordan. Uh, Jerusalem is on the west side of the Jordan, and so they went to the east side of the Jordan, close to where John the Baptist had been baptized. And so, right before Jesus uh, gets the word that Lazarus is sick, he's across the Jordan, he's on the east side of the Jordan, and messengers come and they say, the one you love, Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, is sick. And they're asking you to come and, and put your hands on him and heal him. And so Jesus tells the disciples, hey, you know, we need to go, we need to go to Jerusalem. We need to go, well actually Bethany is about two miles from Jerusalem. It's down the hill from Jerusalem uh, in a valley there. Uh, but it's very close to Jerusalem. And so, now Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they were obviously people of some means. I mean, uh, I suspect they had a nice house. Uh, it talks about all these people gathering for, for the funeral of Lazarus after he does die, you know, and all these people there. So they, these were prominent people in the village of, of Bethany. So Jesus tells the disciples, he said, look, we need to go, we need to go up to Bethany. 
and the disciples get a little panicky. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. the last time you were in Jerusalem, they were going to stone you. And then Jesus, you know, talks about that he's got to go up there anyway. Uh, <laughs> now, let me, let me pick up here uh, the story here, if I can get my trusty little smartphone here. Uh, and so Jesus says they need to go up there anyway. And one of the disciples, uh, Thomas, I, I think it's the same Thomas that after the resurrection we know is the doubting Thomas. His name was also Didymus. Uh, that's a cool name. Huh? That's a name that's gone to waste. I think next time, you know, next time my wife has a, a child, we're going to name him Didymus. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so <clears throat> Didymus. Uh, so Didymus, <laughs> his reaction is classy. He goes, "Okay, guys, I guess we might as well go with him and die with him," you know. like Thomas Didymus. Um, you know, there's some people that just love to open up a can of worms and eat them. You know, it's like, you know, the, the person that always sees the glass half empty. That's Thomas. So, what's interesting about this, this whole account is Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, that he's going to die. If he, you know, if Jesus doesn't come in England. And so Jesus indicates that he's got to go up there and deal with this situation. But he puts off going up there for two days. Well, in two days, old Lazarus croaks. He dies. Now, I'm going to pick up here with, uh, with the actual story of raising him from the dead. Well, I'm going to actually, I'm going to pick up, I'm just going to look at 17 uh, to uh, the part where he raises Lazarus from the dead. Uh, when Jesus gets up to uh, Bethany, after he's put it off for a couple of days. And uh, when he gets up there, he's met with, Ma he, he's met by Martha. And Martha, look what Martha has to say. When he gets to Bethany, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She's still doing that co codependency thing. She's still trying to rub Jesus' life, as well as her sister Mary's life. She's like trying to put Jesus on a guilt trip that he wasn't there when Lazarus was just sick. But, and then she goes, you know, she sort of smooths it out. She says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. You know, it's come here, come here, go away, go away, you know. Uh, and Jesus says, your brother will rise again. And I love her response. And this is the response of a believer. She is a true believer, you know. Uh, she's still a sinner, but she's a true believer. When she says, oh, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And then Jesus says, and this is the most important thing in this whole passage. Listen to what Jesus says here. Verse 25 of chapter 11. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I'm going to read that again because that is the most important thing in this whole passage. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And at this point, I need to ask you, do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection 
and the life, that no man cometh unto the Father except through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the answer. Okay, so, Martha answers correctly. She said, oh yes, Lord, of course I believe that. I believe you're the Messiah. I believe that you're the Son of God who comes into the world. And then she goes back and she tells Mary. Now, it doesn't say here, you know, it doesn't say here that Jesus said, hey, where's Mary? Get Mary to come. But Martha just sort of assumes that, and maybe Jesus did say it, but Martha goes back, <laughs> codependent as she is, she goes back and she says, Mary, the teacher's here, and he's asking for you. I don't know if Jesus asked for him or not, but Martha seemed to think so. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and she went to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village. He was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn. A lot of supposing going on here. <laughs> when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, she puts Jesus, or attempts to put Jesus on a guilt trip too. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's making a big assumption too. Because guess what? The wages of sin is death. And sometimes God lets people die. Sometimes he allows people to die. Even when we prayed our hearts and our, our you know, we went out our knees praying, oh, please let this person or that person live. Sometimes God lets people die. And all of us are going to die. It is a guarantee that we are going to die. And the reason we're going to die is because we're all sinaholics. Because we're all addicted to sin. We all live our lives in rebellion to God. And the only way, the only way that we can escape ultimate death, the death that lasts forever and ever. The death that sends us straight to hell is by believing on Jesus Christ who says, and I believe this, I am the resurrection of life. The only way that we can avoid dying and being sent to hell is by believing in Jesus as our only hope of salvation. But sometimes God lets us die physically. And in this case, Jesus had a reason for doing this. And the reason he was doing this is because he wanted to demonstrate the power that he is the Lord God Almighty. He is the second person of the uh, he's the second person of the Trinity. And yeah, it's one thing for Jesus to put his hand on somebody's head and heal them of sickness. It's another thing to raise somebody from the dead. Someone who's been dead for four days and stinks. That brings greater glory to God. And it also is a much more powerful, much more powerful preview of what happens in Jesus Christ and his life and ministry. When he's dead three days and humanly speaking, when you're in the tomb for three days, you have started to stink. <laughs> Jesus was in the tomb for three days. But then, the Lord God, the Father, raised him from the dead to show the ultimate power of who God is. All right, so Mary reaches the place where Jesus was, and Jesus saw her weeping, 
And Jesus who had come along, and, and also the Jews who had come along, they were also weeping. And he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come see, Lord. And then the shortest, the short, shortest verse in all the Bible, verse 35 of 11, Jesus wept. We're going to talk a little bit about that, that, uh, what it means that Jesus wept in just a minute. And then Jesus, he's weeping. And the Jews make this huge assumption. They go, see how he loved him so much? He's crying because he's dead. But Jesus knew exactly what he was about to do. That wasn't why he was crying. He wasn't right. The Jews just made a huge incorrect assumption there. So, Jesus was deeply moved. We're going to talk about why he was so deeply moved. Yes, he was grieving, but what he was grieving for was something radically different than what we human beings would assume that he was grieving for. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So, Jesus says to the people there, move the stone. Now, I don't know uh, how many of you have, have uh, been to the Holy Land. If you go to the Holy Land, uh, one, of the, one of the places they have that is a possible uh, place where Jesus is buried is called the Garden Tomb. And it, it's a cave, you know, it's, uh, it's not a big cave, but it's a, a cave, and there's a, uh, you know, a flat place there, and there's a there's a track on the outside. There's a hole that you walk through, but there's a track on the outside where a stone would would be uh, a round stone, a huge round stone would be in that track, and they would roll that stone in front of the, in front of the entrance way. And that's the way that's the way people of means. That's the way they were buried. If you could afford, it's like being buried in a Muslim, Muslim, uh, how do you say that? Mausoleum. mausoleum. You know, one of those mausoleums, you know, one of those real fancy mausoleums, you know. Uh, now, other folks, they were buried at the mount, but this is the way people would means. And so, it also is an indication that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that they were, they were somebodies. They were, they were, you know, they, they were an important family there in the village of Bethany. And uh, so Jesus says, roll the stone away. And here comes Martha again, and she says, woo, woo. Martha says, by this time, there will be a bad odor. Uh, Several years ago, we were living in Palmetto Bay, and my wife had gone, I think, to visit her sister. She'd gone to visit somebody, and so she was away for uh, several days, and I was in charge of feeding the animals. And uh, we had this cat that she was very fond of. Um, the cat had kind of adopted us. Uh, my wife really kind of liked it. It was a beautiful cat. and. Uh, about the first day that my wife was gone, the cat sort of disappeared. And I looked all over the place. I looked and I looked and I looked. After about three days, I found the cat. I found the cat because I smelled the cat. The cat had, in Hurricane Andrew, our air conditioning had been somewhat damaged, not destroyed initially, but Hurricane Andrew the air conditioning thing had been kind of damaged, and there was a there was a, a section of the cover, you know, the, the metal cover that goes over the wire cover that goes over, and so there was a, a hole big enough for the cat to crawl down in there, and so the cat he crawled down into the air conditioner, and of course the fan wasn't going when the cat cat crawled in there, <laughs> but when the cat tried to get out, the fan came on guillotine time and so I had to get the get the cat out of the out 
know, the air conditioning on it was terrible. But I found the cat because it smelled. Now, if, if a small cat could smell as bad as that cat, can you imagine how bad after three days a human body might smell? And they didn't have, you know, they didn't have that thing that we have today where they uh, embalm you. They didn't do that embalming thing. They just wrapped you up in some cloth and stuck you on, you know, stuck you in the cave. So Martha has some, she has some legitimate concern here when she says, it's going to be a bad odor. And Jesus didn't pay that much attention to her. She said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God. Jesus does another, another little rebuking there of Martha. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of those people who are standing around here watching what's going on that they may believe that you, the Father, sent me the Son. When he had said that, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out here. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped in strips of cloth, and the cloth was around his face. You know, this, this is like a, a mummy coming out of the out of the grave. You know, and, and I'm just sort of guessing that the folks that were standing around there, they were a little shocked. I mean, they, they probably were like, whoa, this is like a scary movie. Because they knew Lazarus was dead. He wasn't just a little dead, he was dead. He was dead to the point that he should have been stinking. But he comes out and he's alive. Because Jesus demonstrates the power of God to bring the dead back to life. Now the only reason that we might be able to believe, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they died spiritually. They were dead, dead, dead spiritually. And all of us are born dead spiritually. And the only way that we come to life spiritually is by God's grace. And so the first resurrection that takes place that even allows us to believe in God, even allows us to go seeking God's will in our lives, to ask, to even enable us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is God's mercy and grace that when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, he makes us alive again, spiritually, so that we might actually believe. So Lazarus comes out and Jesus says, take off those grave clothes, let him go. Now, Here's the deal. Lazarus died again. Lazarus died again. Uh, now, he also has experienced the resurrection again. Because when he died the second time physically, he went to glory. He was promoted to glory with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's our hope. That's our hope. Now there's seven lessons that we can learn from this story, and I'm gonna just touch those. Number one, the first of the seven, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Number two, believers are to breathe with hope. And that's what Jesus is doing when he will. He grieved, but he grieved with hope because he knew this wasn't the end of the story. He knew that he was going to raise a Lazarus from 
the dead physically that time, but he knew even into the future something more glorious. He knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead eternally when he died the second time. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13, it says this, we're reminded that we're not like those who have no hope. Our hope is in the eternal one, the one who will one day resurrect us to eternal life with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You know, when I die, and I, you know, uh, maybe not that far in the future, I'm 70, almost 75 years old, but who knows, I might not die for a while. Uh, I thought I was going to die one night when I had a stroke back in uh, March of 2015. In fact, later, about uh, six months after I had the stroke, I went in after a lot of physical therapy. I had learned to sort of walk again. I walk plenty. Some of you probably have noticed that I walk plenty. Uh, but I learned to walk, even without a cane. And I walked in my uh, neurologist's office and uh, He's this wonderful doctor, he's, but he's from India, and he has that, you know, Indian sort of accent. He goes, well, Dr. Guru, you're a phenomena. Mm -hmm. I said, I thought you were going to die. I said, I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, the night you had the stroke, I only gave you a 5% chance to live through the night. <laughs> uh, so, but the thing is, none of us are going to die until God's ready for us to die. And I have to be like Paul, and I hope all of y'all have to be like Paul, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I guess he wanted me to be here this afternoon. That's why he didn't let me die in March of 2015. Somebody had to haunt y'all. Okay. The third lesson in this passage, third, Jesus has compassion for each one of us and he calls each one of us by our name. He knows each one of us. He called Lazarus by his name. Lazarus, come forth. He calls Owen, come forth. Claude, come forth. Michael, he calls us by our name. He knows who we are. He knows us intimately. The fourth lesson. Jesus does everything for one reason and one reason only. Everything that Jesus did was to glorify God the Father. To please God the Father. Jesus does everything for the glory of God. Let me say that one more time. Jesus does everything for the glory of God. Not his glory, but the glory of the triune God. Six, I mean five, I'm sorry. The fifth lesson. The wisdom of Jesus and his knowledge supersedes that of man. Everybody around Jesus and the story wants to know, why did you let him die? Why didn't you come two days earlier? Why didn't you do that? You know, you could have come when he was just ill, when he had a, a, a temperature of 110, you could have come and touched him uh, on the forehead and healed him right then. Why didn't you do that? But God, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, has godly wisdom and godly knowledge that supersedes ours, and he knew that it would bring more glory to the triune God to let Lazarus die and then raise him from the dead. The sixth lesson that we can learn from here, Jesus came to have a relationship with everyone, not just the Jews. He came to, to touch everybody. 
Jesus, in contrast to the Jewish leaders, interacted with all the people because Jesus and the love that he imparts to us, we can share the good news with everyone worldwide, every tribe, nation, and tongue. And Hebrews uh, chapter 10 says, we are commanded to go out into the world, all the world, as Jesus says uh, in Matthew 28 as well. The account of Lazarus, Jesus says, everyone, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And how can they believe unless we take the message to them? You know, sometimes we get bogged down in that predestination and election thing. We don't know who's elect. It's not our job to know who's elect. That, that you know, the two kinds of business, my business and none of my business. It's really none of my business who's elect. My business and what God has given me to do is to proclaim the gospel to everyone because we don't know who the elect are and they can't believe unless they hear. The seventh and last thing, Jesus is our ultimate teacher. Jesus is the one who ultimately shows us the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that Jesus didn't come immediately, but he waited two days. And he let Lazarus die in order to glorify God the Father even in a greater way by raising Lazarus from the dead. Lord, we pray that you would bless us today as we take and we apply the lessons from this, this uh, account, this historical account, that we might live our lives differently because we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes into the Father except through him. We ask these things in Jesus' name, for his sake and his glory. Amen. Our closing hymn. I don't remember exactly what it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, what is that? 479.
and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've never taken the opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, not some cheap mouthwash salvation where you said a prayer one time and say you're good to go and just go off and live however you want to. That ain't it. We're initiating a relationship with our Lord and Savior. We're walking through life, trusting in Him, talking to Him, praying to Him, praising Him, thanking Him, living a life that's part of the solution, not part of the problem. Through His power, through the Holy Spirit that's in our life, once we believe we can initiate that process through a simple prayer, something like this. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I repent of my sins. I know that I ain't going to be perfect in this life, but I can sin less. I will not be sinless, but I will, Lord willing, with your power and help, I will sin less. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I trust Jesus Christ as my only hope of salvation. In his precious name, amen. 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 Our uh, closing hymn is softly and tenderly falling, and uh, the scripture verse is from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest.
Christ as your Lord and Savior, today's the day. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We know that at some point it will bring death. And if you know Jesus Christ, you have the you have the promise of the resurrection. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are under condemnation and destined for the hellfires of damnation. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Receive the benediction. Now, may the love of God the Father, the grace and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you both now and forevermore. And the congregation said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming today.